Alrighty, so now it's time for the panel portion of the day, where we bring together multidisciplinary professionals to talk about specific challenges and topics that benefit from a One Health approach. So hi everyone, I'm Aradna Grover, and I will be moderating our first panel for the day, which is the Innovations in Environmental Health panel. So the goal of this panel is to educate us on the current advancements in environmental health, particularly in relation to One Health practices. And so the panel will discuss the necessity of novel solutions to long-standing environmental issues and focus on how individual speakers are working to address these issues on both a local and global scale. So our first speaker today is Dr. Rogers Bennett, who is a research associate, associate with the Karen C. Dreyer Wildlife Health Center at UC Davis and is a senior environmental scientist and specialist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. She is based in the Bodega Marine Lab, where she leads a team investigating marine ecosystem health and fishery management and marine conservation in a changing ocean climate. So welcome, Dr. Rogers Bennett. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to go ahead and share your slideshow right now. Well, I would just like to thank you for inviting me to be part of this symposium on this very important topic. I think that uh, Dean Larimore's presentation was uh, fantastic in bringing together all of the aspects of One Health that we're all thinking about grappling with and trying to implement. And particularly the end of his conversation is where I will pick up from in terms of talking about more of a One Health or planetary health. Also some of the goals of the COP26 that Dean Larimore touched on, uh, thinking about the marine environment and how most of our globe is the ocean. And so the health of our oceans is really going to be impacting the whole world and the environments, the animals and the people in it. So I'm going to talk about the marine environment and how our climate has been changing and impacting our marine environments and how the ramifications of that are going to be seen by the organisms and the ecosystem services that these environments provide for humans. So next slide, please. We have all seen photos and know about the degradation that is happening uh, throughout the world for our coral reef systems. These systems provide a suite of ecosystem services to humans and they provide for fish and fisheries and they provide for buffering from the ocean to land bases. They are important for oxygenating our nearshore coastal systems and they're being impacted. Next slide, please. We also know about the degradation that has been happening with our eelgrass ecosystems. Again, another nearshore system that supports fisheries and is important for ecosystem services, particularly foods. Next slide, please. We can see that many of our systems are out of balance in terms of what's happening with uh, some of our echinoderm populations. Here we see divers working to control large crown of thorn sea stars that have been eating some of the coral reefs, particularly in Australia. Next slide, please. And we've also seen how uh, warming of our oceans has been shifting populations. These are uh, photos of lionfish, which have been expanding their range, moving up into places like Florida, where they have been consuming many of the small native fishes that live on the reefs there. Uh, one of the solutions that people have been working towards is developing a lionfish fishery, such that the more you fish lionfish, the better off the reefs are. This would be more than a sustainable fishery. It would actually improve the reefs. So we're terming this more of a restoration fishery. 
And you can see on the right, the lionfish derbies that they've been having uh, to remove some of these uh, invasive predators. Next slide, please. We also know the impacts of diseases um, as we have been experiencing ocean warming. We are seeing things like sea star wasting disease, which has impacted our star populations all the way from Alaska down into Baja, California, uh, Mexico. And this large scale massive disease event we think was a denzovirus. Uh, but there is still a lot more work to be done on this. Uh, and in echinoderm disease uh, studies in general, there's a lot more that we need to know. Echinoderm populations are uh, important drivers of our algal communities, and they're also susceptible to large booms and busts in the populations. So learning more about what's happening and triggering this, these diseases is going to be crucial for our ecosystem knowledge and health. Next slide, please. We know that we're going to be uh, experiencing more marine heat waves and more intense marine heat waves. If you look in the center, we can see that in the 2015-2016 timeframe, our region experienced a massive marine heat wave, which had, as I say, exacerbated some of the uh, sea star wasting disease event. Next slide, please. It also transformed some of our ecosystems that are traditionally uh, thick, rich kelp forests, such as on the left in 2012, you can see the bull kelp canopy that is in the uh, surface of the, of the water and goes all the way down to the bottom. And in 2016, we had 95% of our bull kelp forests in Northern California disappear. This would be analogous to 95% of the redwood forests in Northern California disappearing in one year. It was a huge ecosystem impact. Next slide, please. If you look at satellite imagery of this, you can see the uh, pale yellow color on the left in 2008, as opposed to hardly any kelp at all on the right in 2019. Underwater, this looks like a kelp forest on the left, lower uh, left. And what we're seeing now is a sea urchin barrens dominated predominantly by purple urchin on the lower right. Next slide, please. This has had important impacts not only to killing off species and mass mortality events, unusual mortality events, but we're also looking at the health of the survivors and this has been seriously impacted. Next slide. You can see that more than 25% of the survivors now are shrunken at all of our fishery locations. Next slide, please. Not only has the body condition been reduced in the survivors, but we are also finding shr shrinkage scores within the gonad. Next slide, please. Which is translated into fewer mature eggs per female body weight uh, in the pre-kelp forest decline period as versus the post. Next slide, please. We can see that in the sea urchins themselves, they are uh, starving. On the left, we have a, a fed sea urchin that is full of gonad. Uh, this sea urchin is uh, valuable for a fishery, for humans. On the right, we have a sea urchin that's in the barrens. They are empty inside and not worth fishing. Next slide, please. So in the future, we're going to need to be thinking about the health of these ecosystems, 
which are not slowly changing over time. What we're experiencing in the marine environment is the erosion of the resilience of many of our ecosystems, including corals, eelgrass, and kelp forests. We're seeing these dramatic tipping points and the organisms within these systems and the ecosystem services that they provide are being impacted at a very rapid rate. So these are the things we're going to need to grapple with as we move forward with One Health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rogers Bennett. That was great. All right, so I'll go ahead and introduce our next speaker. So our second speaker is Dr. Zaccardi, who received his DVM, MPVM, and PhD in epidemiology from UC Davis, where he emphasized free-ranging wildlife health and the effects of petroleum exposure in wildlife. So he has been an oil spill response veterinarian and coordinator since 1996, responding to more than 50 spills in the U.S. and abroad, including as the Marine Mammal and Sea Turtle Group leader for the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010. So welcome, Dr. Zaccardi. Uh, thank you, Aradna. So I'm um, very happy to be here, very happy to be following up with um, from Chancellor May's wonderful intro and Dean Laramore's presentation, as well as uh, Dr. Rogers Bennett uh, presentation, because it leads very well into what I want to really talk about is more environmental disasters writ large and how uh, the One Health approach can really help in that way. And if I can get my slides, there we go. So um, news flash, if people haven't heard as of a year and a half ago, our federal government has discovered climate change. So uh, this is a slide from the NASA website, which is now allowed, showing that CO2 is indeed increasing and unequivocal scientific evidence of climate change to that. So. With that, what we're seeing, and these are some of the things that Laura was talking about related to the marine environment, but taking it both globally as well as to a terrestrial environment, what we see are rising temperatures really leading to increased uh, ability and increased incidence of extreme weather events. Um, one of the many things that is uh, coming from climate change. So extreme weather events causing things such as flooding storms, wildfires, and the like, leading to significant impacts to all levels of humans, animals, and the environment. When we're talking about extreme weather events, um, these are just some of the billion dollar weather and climate disasters that occurred only in 2020. So if we look at all of the different storms that have occurred, wildfires, uh, droughts and heat waves, uh, et cetera, this, this is our new normal. This is where we are headed unless things turn around and we can find innovative solutions to address and combat climate change, which is the hope of everyone, obviously. If we're talking about wildfires alone and talking about California, this is a figure from Cal Fire, what we see that of the 20 largest California wildfires in history, only five of them preceded uh, the year 2000. So what we're looking at now, again, is a new normal related to how climate change is affecting our environment directly and how that then leads to significant um, events such as wildfires uh, in our ecosystem. Now, closer to home for me and close to home for work that I've done is that climate change is also leading to an increased likelihood and an increased risk of massive oil spills. Um, risks are increasing due to storm impacts um, through offshore oil wells, uh, through the effects on the aging infrastructure of transportation of oil, pipelines, etc. And in fact, we are still, as uh, Dean Larmore mentioned, we are still responding to an oil spill in Southern California off of Orange County. And that spill is likely due to a megastorm coming through 
uh, Southern California, January of this year, causing a ship to have to drop anchor, that anchor dragged along the sea floor, causing damage to the pipeline itself. So these are the types of things that as the climate changes, and as we're starting to see these things, these are the things that are very, very much going to be um, our new normal. So how can we help? How can we address these uh, new issues and how can we address these environmental disasters from um, both a veterinary perspective, human health perspective, nursing perspective, all the people that are here today? Really, it is embracing the One Health concept and the innovative approaches and the collaboration and the transdisciplinary nature of One Health to really address these things from all different angles. As one example of this, and I apologize for the, uh, the uh, very rudimentary uh, imagery on this. Uh, this is a draft image that I did submit. Um, I'm on a National Academies uh, um, committee to rewrite the Oil in the Seas document, which is the international document really addressing oils and oil spill responses. Um, what one of my charges has been is to really introduce the concept of One Health within oil and oil spills writ large. And so this is just looking at some of those interactions between humans, animals, and the environment that can occur due to oil spills, not only the direct effects on those three populations, but also the indirect effects that occur uh, between those elements. So. Two examples that have already been talked about, but I did want to dig a little deeper into them. First is the Oil Wildlife Care Network. Uh, as the chancellor mentioned, 44 organizations working in partnership to provide best achievable capture and care to oil affected wildlife anywhere in the state of California. But really taking that beyond just caring for the wildlife, what we are also doing is caring for the people that might be affected during these incidents. Refugio oil spill in 2015, this is a photo of a gentleman that did find a heavily oiled pelican uh, during that incident. Wanted to do the best thing, wanted to try to save the animals in crisis, collected that animal and tried to find somebody to be able to care for it. Humans are put at danger during oil spills as well. Environment, animals, and the humans by having a professional proactive organization that is collecting and caring for those animals in the best way possible, applying new technologies such as this. This is an image top right, which is our new medical database that allows us to collect intricate information on these animals that are cared for and better understand how oil affects all vertebrate species. What we're doing by having a proactive program that involves 1600 people throughout the state we have the ability to treat the animals, but also to protect people and to share that information so that we have a much better understanding how, of how oil might affect the ecosystem as a whole. The other program I wanted to touch on was also the California Veterinary Emergency Team program that, um, again, both uh, the Chancellor and uh, Dean Larimore spoke on. Uh, this new CVET program is really building on the strengths of the veterinary emergency response team that exists within the School of Veterinary Medicine, very successful program, but it's also leveraging the success of the Oiled Wildlife Care Network to develop a new system that brings everybody who is interested in responding to wildfires and other disasters that affect domestic animals and livestock, partnering with key organizations like the CVMA, partnering with uh, the California Department of Food and Ag, all working under Cal OES and within an incident management structure. What we can do is not only care for the animals that are out there due to environmental disasters, but we're actually protecting the people as well. It is a One Health issue because if people are not going to find successful ways of caring for their animals, they're going to remain in risky situations. They're not gonna leave their houses. They're not gonna evacuate when they need to. So us providing key medical uh, treatment and assisting in the larger incident so people can be safe because their animals are safe is really a One Health approach within this type of a disaster. 
So in conclusion, uh, again, Dean Laramore talked about the sustainable development goals um, uh, that have been developed through the UN. Um, One Health is intrinsic in at least 15 of those. So One Health at its core is absolutely essential for success in the future for addressing some of these environmental disasters that are going to be increasing unless things do change. So ensuring that we can do what we can to care for the animals, but make sure that care is also translated into helping the people in environmental disasters is absolutely the right thing to do. And we're proud to be able to do it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zaccardi. That was great. Our third speaker for today is Mr. Castillo Rubio, who is the founder and chairman of the Planetary Skin Institute, which is a Silicon Valley Research and Development Corporation co-founded with NASA. He is also currently a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on the Bioeconomy and has been an active member of the World Economic Forum's Global, Global Advisory Council for the last eight years, where he designed innovative programs to address global critical issues. So welcome. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. You can see my screen, yeah? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, so I, I, uh, it, it was really interesting and uh, important, I think, to, to hear the preceding presentations. And I'm just going to follow on, uh, I think, very naturally from comments made of that we are indeed living in a new risk normal. Uh, and where extremes are, will be more frequent uh, and more impactful. And wh what I'm showing you is the Amazon Basin. The Amazon Basin is, of course, very important for many reasons. Uh, it's important because probably it hosts 20 to 25% of all life forms on Earth, on land. It's important because it controls uh, a, a significant portion of the hydrological system uh, that is able to feed uh, rain into one of the most important bread baskets of the world in South America. Uh, probably 40 to 60% of the growth of uh, food uh, over the next few years will come from this region. And the Amazon is responsible for providing the rainfall of that breadbasket. Uh, in addition, the Amazon Basin a, um, uh, stores around about 10 years worth of global emissions. And so uh, for all those reasons, of course, the Amazon Basin is hugely important uh, to meet a number of goals, including the ones, importantly, of um, the important work that you guys do on One Health uh, at a planetary level, um, at, a, at a country level, at a local level. Uh, trying, to, trying to change my slides here. Okay. So the Amazon Basin as a whole um, is, has been, has been um, changing very, very significantly. Uh, as you all know, uh, deforestation, warming, lots of fire, um, similar to California in that extent. But you, what you may not know is in the last 12 years, the Amazon Basin as a whole has experimented six mega extreme events, three mega droughts that left the Amazon, large tracts of the Amazon like this, three mega floods that left the Amazon basin, large tracts again of the Amazon basin like this. And each individual event is estimated to be, uh, to have a probability of occurrence of less than one in 200 years. So in a nutshell, we have a major, major ecosystem, which is important globally for this region where I live, but also globally, has been oscillating between these two extremes. And this uh, may actually be the final signal that has been predicted for a long time now that um, it is very probable, uh, I believe now, 
that um, 60% of the Amazon uh, will be lost to a degraded savanna. Uh, I was, I had the pleasure of collaborating with uh, top global climate scientists and doing a lot of modeling work in the Amazon. Um, and even though the models always pointed out to this possibility, what is very, very um, uh, uh, concerning, I would say, is the fact that we already see uh, tracts of the Amazon which are um, uh, where you see plants and trees and animals, which are characteristics, a characteristic of savanna environments and not wet tropical forest environments like the Amazon. And this is even more concerning. Uh, and this takes us to, to the topic that I really want to uh, discuss today quickly with you, uh, which is related to the fact well, not the fact, but the probability, the, 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 the probably the very high probability that uh, the largest uh, um, pool of sonotic viruses, undiscovered uh, sonotic viruses uh, that happily live today in primate, rodent and bat hosts in the Amazon basin because of the massive in the environmental degradation that has been occurring over the years and has accelerated over the last few, in, in, a, in addition to the um, increasing and important contact surfaces between humans, wildlife, and livestock. As you may know, uh, one of the major drivers of deforestation is very low uh, productivity cattle ranching in the Amazon, in which, of course, we are literally burning up the Amazonian library of knowledge, of biological knowledge, and putting in its place a supermarket to feed the world of meat. Uh, and that, of course, will have major, major impacts, not only for our health and the people uh, here in this part of the world, but around the world, I believe as well, if we, if we actually don't prevent these risks, which is why, uh, in fact, uh, with strong core leadership from um, a future panel member here present, uh, Dr. John Amasset, and colleagues uh, of UC Davis, we've been uh, thinking and developing uh, and beginning initial prototyping to build an Amazon-wide early warning system for uh, virus spillover. Uh, no one knows, of course, uh, what will emerge, when, uh, where, but given the very high probability of this occurring, and given the fact that the world has already spent 28 trillion in the current pandemic, it is, it is a complete non-brainer to actually already build the, uh, uh, this Amazon-wide early warning system uh, that would entail, of course, hunting for unknown viruses with son uh, sonotic potential. Uh, and after doing that, of course, characterize the risk, for example, using the frameworks that Jonah developed, uh, uh, like the spillover frame risk framework event that was mentioned earlier. Uh, by some of the by, by one presenter earlier, um, uh, but also, but also, of course, uh, after uh, we are successful in doing this, and of course, there are major, major scientific and engineering and scale up uh, challenges which are not solved uh, at all. Um, we we hope uh, to uh, develop uh, as a consequence of this effort biofoundries uh, in the Amazon that are able then to develop the diagnostic and the vaccine platforms that are necessary, again, before it's too late. And of course, you guys uh, have pioneered in the world and Jonah and her team and Christine, and many of you um, in, in the, the UC Davis uh, School of uh, Veterinary Science have pioneered a lot of the work uh, that now makes this possible, even though very, very challenging. Now, in the Amazon basin, uh, you may also not know, 
that with analog practices, meaning with people just walking around, scientists, field scientists walking around the, um, the borders of the Amazon, the, the bits of the Amazon that are accessible, which is a very small portion of it, discover one new species uh, every three days. And of course, this, is, this speed of classification and detection is very low indeed for the level of challenge that we have, which is why um, our uh, mission is to deploy a, deploy a swarm of autonomous uh, systems, robots, submarines, uh, small terrestrial robots, uh, small autonomous drones with uh, packed with advanced sensor payloads that complements, of course, field scientists um, in order to rapidly screen areas of the Amazon which, which, in which there is likelihood to find these hosts uh, where they uh, drink water, where they urinate, where they defecate, so as to be able to build a library uh, of where these, uh, the, these events may arise down the road. Uh, of course, this not only involves robots and sensors, it involves lots and lots of computational biology platforms that need to scale to the level of the challenge. The one thing we know in our consortia is, uh, this is a global consortia that I will present to you in just one second, the thing we know is that it is almost an impossible challenge. Uh, but we also believe that given a problem, if you put enough good engineers, scientists, design people, policymakers, uh, and a whole set of uh, disciplines that care about a mission, then that mission is solved. That is the power of us humans. Uh, uh, collaborating across frontiers, across nations, across disciplines, uh, and of course, at the center of uh, what we want to build is Jonas spillover risk framework in order to properly uh, take into account the risk parameters and risk attributes to, to uh, 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 practically build an early warning system that can inform public health authorities globally, regionally, nationally, locally. Just to end, um, I, I want to just to highlight, you know, just a few of our important global uh, collaborators that come from uh, the public world, come from academia, come from the private world. These are all folks, and UC Davis, of course, um, with, uh, with Ijona uh, really co-leading this effort uh, or trying to co-orchestrate this effort together with me, with a bunch of, uh, a bunch of other players uh, uh, and importantly players, leading players in the Amazon basin to develop this work um, is amazingly challenging and problematic, as I've mentioned before. Uh, and we want to accomplish this with the help of all of you. So thank you very much, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much for your presentation. That went really well. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Lamb, who is a wildlife scientist at the University of British Columbia, who works on understanding and mitigating challenges to wildlife movement and demography through collaborations with the First Nations governments ENGOs and scientists, Dr. Lim works to bring evidence to action on the ground in order to have meaningful benefits for both people and wildlife alike. Thank you so much and take it away. Thanks everyone and thanks for having me. Um, today we're gonna to talk about uh, endangered mountain caribou in British Columbia, but I'm sharing this photo with you today because I'm going to cop out for maybe some of my disjunct presentation because this was my morning. So this morning we, collared a grizzly bear that was causing trouble in town here and you know this kind of links into these one health aspects of you know as we transform this landscape of course you know there's benefits to keeping people sheltered and you know providing food for ourselves but you know as we sort of encroach into wildlife habitats and alter the way that animals um, historically have used these areas and and move around them you know there's sort of this hands-on approach where uh, you know, essentially we have a responsibility to find ways to better coexist with these bears and all kinds of animals. So this is just an example in real time of um, an animal that uh, got a collar this morning and she's just on her way into the wild to be relocated and, and all is, um, we're all hoping she does well and doesn't come back. So, you know, just linking that, that landscape and that, that kind of um, applied conservation angle. 
So today I, I want to talk to you about a, uh, an indigenous led stewardship program that is basically rekindling um, connections to animals, uh, changing the way in that uh, the landscape is being uh, looked after and treated and, and recovering a culturally meaningful species, which is the endangered mountain caribou. The first thing that I want to say is, you know, I'm going to be the, the face of this today, but I am by no means the only person responsible for everything I'm going to show you here. And, you know, there's a big team of folks that are on the ground working day in and day, uh, day out to look after these caribou and look after their land. So um, West Moberly and Soto First Nations, um, Scott McNay and veterinarians and biologists across northern BC. And I kind of put the asterisk big team on the ground because they also, you know, do all kinds of other things beyond that, just like all of us, but roughly they're the folks that are, you know, making this change. And then there's this big team of us kind of at our computers. I mean, I live about 700 kilometers south of where these caribou are. I live in uh, the Southern Rockies of uh, Canada, which is ironically the Northern Rockies up to America. So it's all relative, um, but you know, we kind of have this, um, indigenous uh and science connection where we're kind of are we're braiding indigenous knowledge um treaty rights and and western science together to try to make some meaningful action on the ground so you know to kind of link it into this one health aspect and how um wildlife conservation how habitat uh change and um and people you know really all link together and they're not uh, none of those things exist in silos. They're all sort of interconnected. Uh, a quote by Julian Napoleon, who's a Soto First Nations member and is also a caribou guardian on the project. I think this quote really kind of, uh, you know, brings home why recovering wildlife and how, um, how in times harvesting them and being part of uh, those wildlife's life is very important. So, you know, Julian says that his work comes down to my sloth philosophy around food. For the moose and caribou to thrive, we need to continue to honor them. Eating them is a part of that. There is no way to express deeper gratitude to an animal than when it offers itself to you and you bring it home and share it with the people you love. So part of the, the issue here is that um, West Moberly and Soto First Nations have historically uh, depended on caribou. This is a caribou here um, for their traditional way of life and um, and the way they move around the landscape and uh, you know a, a hundred years of habitat change and colonization have really changed that um, landscape for caribou but it's also changed the the nation's relationship with those caribou as they decline so you know the ability to harvest them and for food security for themselves has declined quite a bit so you know this is really about trying to rekindle the ability to have a meaningful harvest of caribou and having caribou on the landscape and these things come out in, in quotes from elders. So, you know, an elder saying that um, the goal would be to eat caribou before they die. You know, this is something that has been taken from them, but it's also something that we can, you know, through collaboration and through uh, proper landscape stewardship and some short-term conservation actions, we can try to recover those caribou and to rekindle those cultural connections. And in Canada, you know, there's steps towards reconciliation with Indigenous people um, and, and UNDRIP commitments, um, food sovereignty, and then of course, self-determination in indigenous territory. So this is kind of the heart of the issue. You know, as I say, none of these things are in isolation, you know, wildlife declines, um, cultural connections and landscape stewardship are all sort of one and the same at, at the heart of it. And this is a logging in British Columbia is one of our main industries and it, it employs a lot of people and is an important part also of BC's more recent culture. But it's also done at times at a very widespread and industrialized scale. And this basically turns the landscape into, you know, a very young age and sometimes more productive landscape because of more shrubs. And that basically brings in more moose and more deer and following those moose and deer come wolves and other predators. So that is different than a caribou's normal um, life plan, which is to basically live in old growth forests that are not that productive and don't hold um, that many other species. And they kind of eco to living at a high elevation or an old growth forest. So now there's all these other animals there, basically those wolves that are kind of wandering around trying to um, 
eat other other ungulates like moose and deer, they bump into these caribou and basically the predation becomes unsustainable for caribou. So at the heart of all of this is a landscape level problem. So to kind of zoom in on where we're talking about here, way up in the snowy north, we got uh, snow on the mountains here in Canada this morning. And, you know, we're in central British Columbia and kind of in the, the central Rockies for us. And this area is really where the Rockies pinch down to a, a really narrow um, width. And there's a number of caribou herds in here. So West Morbley and Soto First Nations, um, they live just to the east of one, a really important caribou herd called the Klinziza herd. So you can kind of see that at the top of the screen. You can also see the red herds have already been extirpated. They've been, uh, we've lost those herds completely in the last few years. Um, sorry, auto advance there. Um, so, you know, we are losing caribou rapidly and I'll show you why in a second because this landscape is changing dramatically. So these are those same herd boundaries um, and all of that sort of mess on the map is industrial level extraction. So whether it is um, clear cuts uh, for logging, which is in the orange and the red, um, roads in the black, um, coal mines or damming, you know, this landscape has changed dramatically. And what that does is, you know, we see caribou declines. So this is, you know, the last 20 years of these caribou up until about 2015. So there's about 300 and then they plummeted down to about 38. And that was when indigenous led recovery started. And we know that that kind of 300 is a, is a low estimate. That was sort of this 1995, that was when Western science started to count these caribou. But in reality, these caribou have been much higher before. So the first action that was taken was maternal penning. So what this looks like is we basically move caribou into an area in March where they can have their calves safely. So one big problem is that those wolves will basically run around and kill those calves early in their life. So they're very vulnerable. And, and really it's not even just wolves, it's wolves and um, wolverine and grizzly bears and black bears. So we move these caribou into an enclosure up at high elevation and they're basically looked after full time by um, indigenous guardians who are on site who feed them and check on them every day and ensure their well-being. And they're basically in a very um, loosely contained area. They're, they're in their natural habitat. It's quite a big area and they kind of roam around and there's just a very light fence on either side. So then they have their calves. Uh, you can see here a, a young caribou calf and you can imagine why they're very vulnerable at this early stage of their life. So, you know, we grow, we, we allow them to um, grow in size until they're not as vulnerable and then eventually uh, we release them. So here's a handful of caribou. I mean, as I said, there was only 38 at the bottom of the, the decline. So, and you know, there was only about 15 to 18 females. So we had very few to even start bringing into the pen. So we bring in about 10 to 18 every year and really good success. I mean, the, the calf reproduction inside the pen is double what we see outside, uh, just mostly due to uh, the better survival of the young. The pregnancy rates are very similar, but it's the survival of the young. Here, I'll show you a video of us releasing them. So, you know, you might kind of imagine the situation where they come running out and they stream out of the pen because they can't wait to get out. But in reality, it's sort of this very uh, dull event where they just sort of wander out. It can take many hours. They're pretty happy in the pen. They're safe. They're fed. Um, they're very, uh, easily habituated animals. They take well to captivity. There's a calf. You can see how much bigger it is. So then they're on their own and, you know, they do quite well out there. And here's an image of, uh, the cabin up at elevation and one of the indigenous guardians. And the next piece is predator reduction. So, you know, this landscape has been somewhat altered drastically, and there is a higher number of wolves than have ever historically been there. So through indig through trapping by indigenous peoples and the province, there the wolf numbers have been reduced to a more sort of normal uh, abundance. So this is a indigenous trapper that does a lot of uh, the work up there. And this is what it looks like now. So you know this decline goes on. We'll catch up to where I showed you last time down there at the bottom. And this is sort of what the last eight or nine years has looked like. So we've, you know, almost tripled this herd uh, in, the, in the last eight or nine years. But the final piece is about 
habitat protection. So, you know, these are short term actions to stave off the complete loss of these caribou. These are meant to be very short term. So what the nations in the province of BC and Canada did is they signed an agreement to protect 2 million acres of caribou habitat. And that included, um, you know, reductions in obviously a complete reduction in the industrial footprint and then also funds to restore that. So now you can see the Klinziza up at the top there. Um, the red protection is very high. You know, this is very high certainty of protection. And then there's some moderate protection all the way around. And that protection extends to the other herds as well. And one more slide here. I mean, basically why this worked is a number of reasons. Um, you know, the exercising of indigenous rights and title on the landscape to get things done immediately before these caribou were lost and also the weaving of knowledge systems to make good outcomes, increasing the survival and recruitment of caribou. And then just having everybody at the table, you know, we had veterinarians, biologists, uh, industry partners, environmental groups, and everybody kind of rallied together to try to look after this landscape and look after these caribou. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lamb. That was very cool to see, especially in the picture in the beginning. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so the next part of the panel is gonna be our Q&A session. So if all the panelists could have their cameras and mics on, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and ask you some questions that attendees have asked, and then we can ask some general questions for the whole panel as well. So our first question is to Dr. Rogers Bennett. I know you answered this in the chat, but could you please tell us again if resistance to heat effects could be genetically engineered or bred into kelp and other marine organisms to restore balance, please? Yes, I think that some of these solutions are going to be key to overcoming some of the marine heat wave impacts. So the idea that, you know, looking at populations that are growing in the southern portion of the range and looking at individual family lines that may have genetic resistance to heat and warming. Uh, they've been using that in coral reefs, looking at not only individual uh, families that have resistance, but also species that are more resilient. And they're calling these uh, super corals. I think that's gonna be an important tool in our toolbox for kelps and some of these other impacts. Uh, the same can be said for disease resistance. In other words, in the black abalone populations, we had a massive disease event that was a bacterial infection. And we have researchers uh, up in the University of Washington who were looking at San Nicolas Island for uh, families and individuals that survived some of these disease events and looking to breed them uh, to, to enhance and bolster the, the population's resilience to some disease events. So I think these are going to be important tools. Thank you so much. That's a great answer. Um, so the next question is for Dr. Zaccardi. So one of our attendees would like to know which sustainable development goal out of the 17 presented by the UN do you think connects best with the One Health approach? Uh, that, that's a great question. I, I honestly think it's probably SDG number 17, which is talks about connectivity and collaboration. I mean, really at the heart of One Health is bringing people from all different expertise levels together to address large scale issues. And so that, that, is, that is at the cornerstone of One Health, but One Health can be applied to just about every one of them, but that one definitely. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, our next question is for Mr. Castillo Rubio. So one of our panelists said that she found the idea of surveying the Amazon super exciting, but they wanted to know if there was any way to begin to re allow for reforestation in the Amazon with resilient native species of plants? Yes, uh, of course, we, we actually need to do massive reforestation uh, with um, native species in, the, in large tracts of the Amazon. Something like, to give you a sense, something like uh, 100 million hectares uh, needs to be reforested. Uh, a challenge that has, the world has never executed before with native species in a tropical forest. Um, and, and so it, it, 
there there are there are I think a number of things that need to be that need to occur if we're going to save the Amazon from extinction. We are very near um, massive tipping point that we can't uh, come away from, and so uh, that is why, in fact, there is there's another track that I did mention, which is this one, for precisely the reason that the the person that asked the question. Perfect. Thank you so much. So our next question is for Dr. Lamb. So one of our attendees would like to know, how did the relationship between scientists and indigenous groups come about, particularly in your area? And how do you continue to foster this relationship today? Yeah, that's a good question. In, in this case, it came from a real need to save these caribou. I mean, that Klinziza herd was in about kind of the three to five year time frame of being completely lost. So, you know, there was this immediate need to do something and, and the nations, you know, they have the right and title to look after those landscapes. And once it was decided that these, it was not going to be acceptable to let these caribou go to zero, then, you know, the relationship with scientists came about just from a need of, of capacity and other folks that had been working on caribou and to, you know, just uh, have more folks on the ground. So, the, the nations basically contacted um, a consulting company and who's been working on caribou for a long time and they kind of got on board and and then of course you know the relationship grows with trust and 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 it takes a long time and you know we're at a, at a good good point here and it comes with communication and it also it's obviously easier when it's successful as you could imagine you know when you're tripling this caribou herd partly because there's a good relationship and good communication, but it's fairly easy to keep the relationship good when uh, given that we're having quite a bit of success. So it's, it's going well. Thank you so much. We actually had one more question for you. Um, so understanding the delicate balance of local means of production and economy and environmental impacts, are there any policy movements to help kind of at the level of land stewardship to ensure sustainable growth? For the practice of environmentally impactful farming or mining or anything like that? Yeah, I don't, not at a big scale. I mean, again, it's kind of in line with that one health thing is we we're so siloed, you know, I mean, the, the, even the ministries that look after that, you know, they are simultaneously promoting that development because that's their mandate while, you know, say the wildlife and land ministries are trying to look after that landscape and have opposing mandates within the same government. So, no, I, I would say we're not doing a great job of that. And, you know, we need more cross linkages because we have a fixed footprint here and a fixed, you know, pool of resources that are not necessarily getting spent in the most efficient manner possible. Got it. Thank you. So the next question is kind of to the whole panel. So if we could have maybe Dr. Zaccardi start us off, um, how can we account for and manage major climate impacts that result in ecosystem shifts or regime shifts when addressing environmental health? Nice, easy question to start things <laughs> off with the panel. Um, obviously, it's hard, right? It, the COP26 is a perfect example of that um, as far as the issues that are coming up and the, the political um, decisions that are being made, people, people acknowledging the fact that things need to change. Um, but needing the political will to be able to do it and to move forward with it. I mean, uh, the decisions as to which countries are going to stop using coal. Um, most countries, the US unfortunately is not one of those. Um, again, that's political connotation. So I think first step is acknowledgement and the fact that things do need to change. Um, and the environmental health is dependent on that, but then having the political fortitude to be able to move forward with things, uh, I think is absolutely critical. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Rogers Bennett, do you maybe have something to add to that? Yes, um, I first wanna just echo what, what Mike said in that um, acknowledging the problem and thinking about the political will and the dollars that might be needed to do some of this work. Uh, Juan Carlos's example of the Amazon is, is a beautiful example that 
if we're going to restore many of these forests, we're going to have to put some money and energy into it. I think the same holds true for the marine environment. Um, if we're going to restore kelp forests, that's going to require um, a concerted effort and some funding. And I'm happy to report that we have uh, some new legislation in California that's going to be earmarked for uh, giving funds to kelp restoration, which is very exciting. Um, I think that it's going to require us to think about our food systems. So um, our fisheries, when they're being stressed with climate change, aren't going to be able to produce as much fish as they used to. And if we keep the fishery management the same, we're going to lose those species and those individual uh, fisheries. We can't keep extracting the same amount when they're facing climate change. Um, the same holds true with some of the examples that Dean Larimore highlighted in terms of our aquaculture. Those uh, aquacultured species are going to be facing uh, warming and disease events, and we're going to need to have uh, increased surveillance of diseases and mortality events in species that we don't know very much about their biology. Uh, I pointed out we don't know much about echinoderm diseases, yet they drive a lot of our kelp forests. We don't know much about shrimp diseases and oyster diseases. So these are things that the folks in One Health Institute and, and at Wildlife Health Center are working on. Um, I think that the same holds true for our endangered species and trying to regrow some of our uh, endangered species such as caribou, we're going to have to know about their health. Uh, and when we are growing in the captive breeding programs, such as the white abalone captive breeding program, we need to know a lot about abalone health to keep those, those species healthy uh, when they are going out into a climate that's a lot warmer. They're going out into a kelp forest that has a lot less kelp. So this is going to be important for restoration as well. So we need all you students working on some of these projects because there's a lot of work to do out there. If, if, if I can comment. Yes, please. P perhaps as a, as a as a, as a complement to, to that uh, and to, to give my own personal perspective. And it, it is just my personal perspective. Uh, after having participated in probably five or six COPs in the past, uh, in, the, in, the, in the many years that have passed, I am not too hopeful that uh, we will arrive to anything really material uh, at all. Um, and the reason why at the core of that is uh, because we, we have a fundamental problem to address, which is actually not in science and in technology, but it is the way, the way that, that we are, we humans are all incentivized uh, in, in the world today, which is through the way that economics actually uh, works. We really need to reinvent uh, capitalism um, if we're going to have any fighting chance uh, to really deploy the solutions at scale that you guys in One Health and others uh, in the multiple other areas of the, for example, the energy transition or saving the oceans, et cetera, need to execute. Um, what, how, what, what I see it, to a large extent, uh, unfortunately, it's like what Einstein said something like um, it, that it is a sign of madness that when you repeat the same, the same initiatives over and over again and you expect different results, it is a true sign of insanity. And this is our current state. And it is important to recognize that, I think, 
um, uh, not to have uh, um, hope on something that uh, will not yield the results that, that I think we, we need. Uh, we don't need any evolution. We need large scale revolutions. Um, using the power of, uh, that you guys have of, uh, and the power of human ingenuity that is uh, absolutely abundant, right? And people of, of good intent, like all of you. And so we, we actually do need the students, as Laura mentioned, and the researchers to collaborate on this, but realizing that the, also there are very fundamental problems that are stopping us. Thank you. Dr. Lam, do you want to maybe add a little bit in? Yeah, I don't have a lot to add. There's been a lot of great things said. I guess, you know, just kind of building on what everybody said is obviously we need to start early. I, I mean, by the time um, we don't want to do it when it's knocking on our doorstep and the emergencies are already there, it's really expensive to deal with it, you know, at the emergency state. And, you know, folks in California and us in BC know a lot about wildfires and it's sort of like that, I mean, if your house backs onto a public forest and it's, you know, at, at its burn interval, you kind of have two choices. I mean, you can think about fire smarting your house and your property and get sprinklers out in the spring when times are good, or you can do it in October while it's burning down. And you can imagine that, you know, if you have to do it inevitably, then the former is a lot better time to be thinking about fireproofing your house rather than when it's burning. So. You know, it's kind of like that. It'll be a lot actually cheaper if we decide that we are going to have to do something, which it seems like we have decided given all these commitments, but we don't come through on them. But, you know, if we do decide we have to do something then it's clearly easier to do it in a sort of planned and slow burn way, as opposed to at the end, you know, once Miami floods sort of thing. Got it. Thank you so much. So we do have another question for Mr. Castillo Rubio. So what are some possibly public, private, academic, or civil society collaborations going forward that will be necessary to develop and scale impact of the Amazon early warning system for zoonotic virus spillover that's been planned? Yeah, no, thanks. Um, uh, for, for sure, we need that level of collaboration across uh, sectors, disciplines, uh, to, to a large extent, in, if, if, if anyone wants to implement a revolution in terms of solving a very complex problem um, that is in the realm that, that of science and technology, uh, I think that the secret sauce or part of the secret sauce is actually um, uh, putting in a room, a virtual room, a collaboration room, top scientists of multiple disciplines, top engineers of multiple disciplines, uh, uh, top designers, and I'm not, I don't mean graphic designers, I mean people that understand problems and can formulate the problems and how uh, we would be able to solve them step by step. Uh, uh, and of course, having the support of, of the, the public sector though is, is tremendously important because to scale, regulatory change and, and policies are, are very important. But I don't expect any, any government anywhere in the world to solve our own problems. Um, I, I expect that uh, people of goodwill will gather around a problem and just get on and do it. Just a little bit like uh, I think uh, uh, Professor uh, Lermer said about Jonah's attitude. <laughs> I don't want to discuss the One Health is a concept. Let's just do it. I, I, I really sign up to that. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question, which is a broad question, but some color. That's great. Thank you so much. So I had another question that's kind of a broader question for the whole panel as well. So just in terms of encouraging an environment that helps with encouraging innovation, and out of box thinking in general, what are sp some specific resources that you all think would facilitate, facilitate this change to encourage innovation and possibly create an environment that facilitates it as well? So could we maybe start with Dr. Rogers Bennett and then kind of just move down the panel? Sure, I think uh, one of the things that uh, will facilitate innovation is knowing what's going on. So surveillance, 
And this is something that One Health Institute and, and Jonah has been uh, talking about for a long time. Um, it applies in so many regards to diseases, to uh, unusual mortality events. Um, you know, if we don't know that there's a huge uh, mortality event going and we're not doing the proper surveillance, then we won't even be addressing it. Um, and by surveillance, I mean not only counting and measuring animals, but also storing some of the genetic information in the negative 80 freezer and thinking about um, the variants that we have out there before a major bottleneck occurs. So I think surveillance is going to be a, a very important tool for, for innovation. Um, I think the other uh, piece of innovation that's going to really help us is to be cognizant of the fact that the systems are changing rapidly uh, and they have had tipping points and they're not going to be behaving the way they have in the past. So I think those are our big uh, two main elements that will really guide our thinking moving forward. Um, you know, we like Mike Sicardi is doing, we have to expect that there will be oil spill disasters. We have to expect that there will be uh, pandemics in the future. We can't uh, plan for the future being smooth sailing. Thank you for that answer. Does anyone maybe want to add on to that or add something? Maybe, maybe I add a, a, a quick thought where the US actually leads the world by far. Um, and actually it's the US government <laughs> that in, 19, I think 1958, when the Sputnik uh, mysteriously appeared on the sky and people could see it with a naked eye, created DARPA. Um, I think that that model of innovation is unparalleled in the world. It has delivered everything from the internet to uh, most, most recently the beginning of RNA vaccines, for example, that saved us to a large extent from the current pandemic. And it is a model in which uh, there is gigantic autonomy for scientists, engineers, and designers and program managers. So it's not bureaucracies that, 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 um, that uh, define the work or manage the work. It's these guys that come from all sorts, from NGOs, from uh, academia, from companies, from government, just raw talent, multidisciplinary group of people that are basically given 50 million US dollars and five years, just, just on average. And they're told, <laughs> okay, this is a problem and I'll basically feed you pizza for five years and you need to deliver something foundational. And, uh, and of course, they not every time something really, really major comes out, but many times it, they, it does. Uh, now, a lot of people have tried to replicate that around the world. Uh, Europe is trying now, uh, et cetera. I think that we need to create a DARPA for the One Health approach in surveillance uh, and really get on with the job of um, developing a global early warning system for sonotic virus spillover, given the threat that it represents uh, and given the complexity of the problems involved. Um, that's what I would do if I were in the US government uh, would create a DARPA program that is international in nature, because of course, the pathogens are mostly in the tropics, not only, but mostly. Um, so that, that's what I would say about innovation and something to really study. Uh, um, and, and that you should be proud of uh, as Americans. Thank you so much for that response. Um, Dr. Zaccardi, do you maybe want to add on too? I couldn't agree more. 
uh, with Juan Carlos on that. Um, really, innovation is sparked by having different people with different experience levels bringing their information together. I mean, that, that again, is at the cornerstone of One Health. And it, it's something, you know, I think UC Davis is really looking closely at, um, you know, Dr. Mazette, as far as leading the grand challenges uh, efforts uh, on behalf of the campus. I mean, that's a perfect example of trying to really bring together people with different walks, different ideas together to develop new concepts and new ways of looking at things. And that truly is how innovation occurs. And, you know, I, I think that is what it's absolutely needed to be able to address the larger issues that we have. Thank you. Dr. Lamb? Yeah, I'd once again agree with everyone. We're not, we need to have like a, a panel that we disagree and then we have, we duke it out. Um, you know, I think that, you know, my experience has been that there's some value in these grassroots initiatives too. Like, you know, the innovation doesn't have to be at a national or international level. I mean, you can pilot it at your in, in your business or your school or your community. And, you know, these kind of grassroots initiatives can also help, you know, you can innovate at a small scale and show a successful pilot. And then that can run wider. I mean, we can kind of nickel and dime over like national policies, but until it hits the ground and there's like a working example, folks often kind of flounder to implement. So sometimes it's best to just get after it and try. And that's also where you know, the science comes in and, and the One Health aspect in a lot of ways. I mean, most things involve folks that are, you know, have different skill sets than I do per se, you know, economists, economists, well, I'm not going to say it, physicists and, you know, chemists and all kinds of folks that are, you know, beyond what I do, but that kind of collaboration. And then the science piece is monitoring the outcomes, you know, so instead of always sort of trying to surveil for problems, you know, maybe we start gearing science to more towards measuring if if actions are effective, you know, trying to measure outcomes and efficacy. So, you know, that's that's kind of where our research program is shifting in a big way instead of sort of just monitoring things down to zero. I mean, we're just trying to pull levers and see what happens. They're not they don't always work. And that's OK. But, you know, having good science paired with action to show what does and doesn't work, I think, is is a good recipe. And you can do it in your backyard and you can do it in your business and then you can, you know, take it to scale if successful. And I think that's an excellent point, Clayton, is don't be afraid to fail. Right. But if you don't try, you're not going to succeed at the level that needs success. Right. That's a very good point. Thank you. The next question I have, it's just a personal question. I always look for, love getting new book recs. Do you guys have any book recommendations that relate to the panel, that don't relate to the panel? Anything you guys have been reading recently? I got um, Bill, Bill Gates sent around a number to, I don't know who, but pretty well everybody they had random emails to for scientists, this book called um, Avoiding a Climate Disaster. And I read it. I mean, it showed up in my uh, my mail for free, and I read it, and it 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 was you know an economic perspective, of course, and an, and an innovate your way out of the problem, not solve the root of the problem as well issue. But like, I, it was kind of enlightening to think about you know what the energy options are for us, and just if you put dollars to it and figure out if, is there enough square footage on the planet to do solar, like those kind of hard number things. You know, like how would we actually make this work and I, I think there's a lot of paths forward, actually, and the book does a good job of kind of highlighting what I thought was like, oh, we should just, let's just suck it all out of the sun, it'll be easy, and then be like, well, maybe that won't work, and, but it also presents a bunch of viable solutions, so that actually was kind of outside of my zone of um, normal reading, and I did appreciate it, so that was a good one. Thank you. Perhaps mm -hmm. I, I give one. Uh, so I'm not a fan at all of business books uh, because a business book is basically a little, I mean, you could, you, you could, you write a uh, publication, a little article in the Harvard Business School, for example, and people then blow it up typically to be a book, uh, repetitive, of course. But there's one business book bar innovation, which really is amazing. 
And the talks actually about the magic of DARPA, but he, uh, the book is called Loonshot. Not Moonshot, but Loonshot. Loonshot is for crazy people because you have to be crazy to attempt revolutions that, that, that do not have a known solution path. A moonshot is a destination. A loon shot is how, the how of innovation to take you to a moonshot. I would highly recommend that book to, uh, to everyone that wants to uh, enter into, enter or accelerate their work in innovation, loon shot. Thank you so much. I, I would recommend a book called All We Can Save. It's a, a bunch of case studies of just examples of people out there, mostly women who are, who are working in this field. And uh, it's, I found it really encouraging sometimes in my work. I think, oh, maybe I'm the only one thinking about all this. This is a lot to grapple with, but it, 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 was, it was a good book, so you might try that. Thank you. The one I'm rereading right now is uh, entitled Creativity Inc. It's a book by Ed Catmull, uh, one of the co-founders of Pixar. And it really talks about how to bring a collective of truly creative people together to be able to succeed as a team. Um, I read it a couple of years ago when uh, I was thinking about uh, putting my hat in the ring for uh, the OHI director position. And it really spoke to me at that point as far as how to support and really drive creativity, um, but do it in, in a team environment. So. Got it. Thank you so much. So I do have one more question for everyone here. Um, just, it's a little bit more of a general question again. So what are important aspects about the process of innovation itself that you guys think deserves discussion? Maybe Dr. Lamb could pick that one up. Yeah, the, the, the first thing that came to my mind was something we've already touched on, of course, is that like, just trying is sometimes okay, like doing nothing and sort of floundering in uncertainty is also, you know, you basically, you, you're, you de facto failed because you didn't do anything. So, you, you know, I mean, we, we proceed with the best of, uh, with the best evidence and, and intentions that we have. And they don't always work and that's that's okay and that's part of the innovative process like i don't think there's any of you know all these sort of american heroes of small business you know they all have been kicked out of their companies or failed and there are folks that we hold on a pedestal so i don't see why we would hold ourselves to any other standard then we'll probably have some hiccups along the way and that's okay i i i would i would compliment that by saying that what it really requires is a focus on problems, not on solutions, to be really problem focused and resist that we have hammers and that those hammers can be a, a, a can, can actually push a nail or a different type of nail. Uh, thinking hard about the, 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 the problems and maintaining a focus on the problem and the, the, all the dimensions of the problem would lead to more, um, a whole set of possible solutions down the road. But it is difficult to only focus on the problem uh, because there is a temptation to go quickly to a solution, of course. Uh, that is also part of why, um, uh, part of the magic of DARPA, uh, that, that, it folk, that, it folk, that, it, that it really streamlines um, the, the modus operandi of how they go about things by focusing on the problem, the scientific problem, the engineering problem, the design problem, the, the ultimate user problem. Uh, there are many problems and not the solutions. The solutions will emerge. That's, that's the, the notion. 
that, that I think works. Thank you. I think I would just add to that, that, uh, you know, when you are a science person, um, you have this understanding that we don't know what we're doing. But when you're a student, you feel like you should know what you're doing. Um, so the papers are fairly easy to write because towards the end of the process, you figured out what you did. But when you're starting out a project, you're, you're grasping and doing things and, and you don't know what's going to be fruitful and what isn't. And that's part of it. So, so I would say that, you know, not knowing what you're doing is okay. And just keep working at it. And the more summers of, you know, pre data you can collect, the better your project will come out because you'll know more about your system and about your problem and solutions. I can't agree more with all of that. Um, I mean, really never underestimating the value of brainstorming early on and not limiting that and having the uh, courage to change midstream if things don't look like they're going in a direction that's going to lead to a solution to the problem you're trying to solve. I mean, I think, I think those things are key. Thank you so much, everyone. So I think those are all the questions we have today. And thank you guys all so much for taking out the time to attend and speak on this panel. All your perspectives and the discussion and the presentations were very enlightening and very interesting. And we really do thank you for being here. So thank you so much. Thank you. So, so Radna, I was wondering if you can indulge me on this. Would it mm -hmm. be okay if I put a poll to the audience out? Oh, absolutely. Excellent. So Matt Blake, could you put that up for people? Thank you. And Aradna, thank you so much for moderating this panel. It was wonderful. Of course, it was my pleasure. Thank you. I have to say at the time, I did not wish that. I was like, oh, this is very bad timing. <laughs> I'm so glad you were able to make it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And so this concludes the Innovations and in Environmental Health panel. So we're now gonna have a short break for the whole symposium till 1145, when we're gonna start up again with the Innovations and in Policy and Health panel. Oh, we have the poll results up. There we go. All right, so the grizzly bear did win. <laughs> awesome, I well, hope, hope I can bring you guys along next time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And we'll see everyone at 1145. Thank you. Thanks,